Welcome to Lessons for the Journey. Lessons for the Journey is the teaching ministry of Dr. David Clifton. These lessons from Scripture are designed to aid in the journey of faith and the journey of life. Let's open our Bibles and join today's lesson. Well, last week we took a break from our series on revival and we did a little bit of a celebration. So by way of reminder then, we began this little mini-series, God's Plan for Revival. Part one, we talked about what not to do because it's best when God's prophet doesn't decide to run the other way when he gets instructions or what God wants him to do, right? Then we looked at God's preparation for a revival. Jonah needed to be thrown overboard, but in him being thrown overboard, then many of those on the ship became believers because of that. Jonah got in the boat and was heading as far away from God's instructions as he possibly could do, but he couldn't get away from God. And we saw how that even his disobedience served to work in God's plan. So for Jonah's part, he did, he was honest with the others and say, look, you need to throw me overboard and all the storm will go away. So today we're going to finish this little series. We're going to uh, observe how the prophet prays and the message is delivered. So when we left off last time, we were in the first chapter of Jonah. So if you'll turn back with me there to Jonah chapter 1. Look at the last verse in, in uh, chapter 1 and then all of chapter 2, hopefully this morning. And Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to Yahweh his God from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to Yahweh. And he answered me. I cried for help from the belly of Sheol. You heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the current surrounded me. All of your breakers and waves passed over me. So I said, I have been driven away from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to my very soul. The great deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the base of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh my God. While my soul was fainting within me, I remembered Yahweh. And my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who regarded worthless idols forsake their loving kindness. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Then Yahweh spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. So what do we have here? You'll notice in verse 17. We hear so much since you were a little kid, right? What did you hear about the story? Jonah and the whale. Jonah and the whale. Do you know that the, either, neither the word used in the Old Testament or the one used in the New Testament that the King James actually translates whale, neither of those refer to a whale? They refer to a great fish, but they're a generic term for a great fish. See, and you can say, well, the Bible doesn't say it's a whale, so there you go, there's a mistake. No, it's a generic term for a great fish. And when we think of a great fish, what do we think of? A whale. A whale. So let figures of speech be figures of speech, and let Jonah have the same liberty that we have. Okay? It was a great fish. It was a fish big enough to swallow Jonah. Okay? Don't strangle on whether it was a whale or not. Okay? The next thing is, how long was Jonah and the fish? Three days and three nights. 
That's just another mere coincidence, isn't it? We've been talking about coincidences a little bit lately. Just a mere coincidence, right? If you want to, you can turn with me to to Matthew chapter 12. But at any rate, at least listen, Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. Then some of the Torah scholars and Pharisees answered him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But Yeshua replied to them, An evil and adulterous generation clamors for a sign. Yet no sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. If you look through the Gospels, on more than one occasion, Jesus used Jonah as an example of the sign that he would give. He said, the only sign I'm going to give to you is the same sign that you saw with Jonah. As he was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. So I'll be in the earth. You see, God's plan of redemption for humanity was determined, well, from some scriptures we can see, from the foundation of the earth. His crucifixion and resurrection was a foregone conclusion. It was going to happen. And it was a plan that was already in place. Jonah's time in the belly of the fish was part of God's specific plan, both in Jonah's present and in the future. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then Ephesians 1, Paul says, He chose him before the foundation of the world, that he would be holy and blameless before him in love. So God's plan was already in place. This thing with Jonah and the fish was just a little piece of that puzzle. Didn't take God by surprise when Jonah decided he was going to run in the opposite direction of what he was told to do. And see, once inside the fish, there was a bit of a transformation, okay? Jonah went in a rebellious prophet, and when he came out, he was a repentant prophet. He said there towards the end of the passage we read, that which I have vowed I will pay. God ever had to work in your life like that? Bring you to a place where he had to change your mind about something, whatever it was? Make difficult circumstances in your life? How many of you know that when you're praying, five minutes is like an eternity? You say, I'm going to pray for five minutes. You say, you look to see what time it is, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray some more, and 90 whole seconds have elapsed, or something like that. It seems like forever, okay? It's very similar when you're in troublesome situation, isn't it? Some things seem like they take forever. How long must this ordeal have seemed? Three days and three nights, he's in the whale, in the fish's belly. And I've heard people say, Well, God won't give you more than you could bear. See, I take exception to that. I think sometimes God does absolutely bring you more than you can bear on purpose. Because when you're flat on your back because you can't bear what's going on, when you're stuck deep in the the fish's belly, you've got no place to look but to God. And so I think God does bring problems to us sometimes to help us stand back up, to know that we need him to help us stand back up. But back to Jonah. Now imagine with me, okay, he's inside this great fish, and regardless of what the cartoons have shown you, I don't think there was a raft in there that he was able to (laughs) climb up on. We see that in a lot of the cartoons. Jonah's floating around, and I'm not going to get too graphic here, but Jonah's floating around in all these juices. Okay? That's a pretty severe punishment, isn't it? I mean, all he did was what? Disobey Almighty God. Man, our culture would be straightened out if we had a little bit more of that going on this day and age. But think about it. His prayer shows his thought processes while he was in the fish. But could God have chosen something a little less dramatic to get, get him set back on track? I mean, couldn't he... Why did he put him inside the fish? Well, that's important thought. Hold on to that thought for a minute, and I'll come back to it. 
Then look at verse 10. Then Yahweh spoke to the fish, and it vomited him out on dry land. Well, what happened in the meantime? Jonah's crying out. I cried for help from the belly of Sheol. That's death. From the belly of death, I cried out to you. You heard my voice. He was being disobedient when he turned back to God, though God heard him. You heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and currents surrounded me. He was in the middle of all of the circumstances that occurred because of his bad decision. So I said, I've been driven away from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. I've been driven away from your sight. Why? Was he really driven away from God's sight? He took himself away. He was running away from God. He's been turned away in the sense that he is receiving the punishment for his actions, but now he's realizing, I shouldn't have been running. I need to turn back towards the temple. That's some symbolic language for turning back to God, to doing what he wants me to do. Water encompassed me to my very soul. The great deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. How far down did he go? I went down to the base of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me. Now I'm sure there's some figurative language in here, but he's sinking. He's going under. You've brought my life, brought up my life from the pit, O oh Yahweh my God. While my, while my soul was fainting within me, I remembered God. See, this is some, why God has to bring us to these type of crisis situations sometimes. We've been doing things our own way for so long and getting away with it and getting farther and farther away from God and our conduct getting worse and worse till God has to do something catastrophic to get our attention. And they say, oh, that's right, God, you're supposed to be in charge. And we turn our mind back to him, to serving him again. I remembered Yahweh, I'm in verse 7, remembered Yahweh and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. For those who regard worthless idols, forsake their loving kindness. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. And here's the turnaround. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. He knew all of these things, but he was trying to run away from those things. You can be a true believer and still decide you're going to turn your back on God. And you can go out and live just like anybody else in the world for a while. And then God's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, no, no, you're mine. You don't get to do that. And he'll do what it takes to bring you back. But then verse 10. The Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up on, the la- on dry land. Seems like it, if, if the Lord hadn't told the fish to, he'd been carrying Jonah around for a while longer. But the Lord said, that's enough. Finally, after three days, it's God's time, and Jonah finds himself back on solid ground. What happens next? As soon as he gets on solid ground, it's almost like God says, now that I have your attention, look at first verse of chapter 3. Actually, let's look at 1 through 4. Now the word of Yahweh came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out to it, this very call which I am going to speak to you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of Yahweh. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go into the city, one day's walk, and he called out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. If you notice, God didn't have to repeat himself this time. And Jonah didn't take off in the other direction. God repeated his instructions. Jonah went directly to take, take care of business. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh. Now look at verse 3. It says, Nineveh was an exceeding great city, or however your translation may have it. It is possible that at that time, Nineveh was the largest city in the world. It said that the walls that enveloped the inner, inner city was to walk around them, there was an eight-mile walk around the city. It's estimated that the metropolitan area, the city and then all of the outlying area, occupied in circumference about 60 miles. 
Now, granted, there were skyscrapers and all of that and so forth. You know, they didn't build the buildings, but so high, it was clay brick and whatnot. But they're estimating that the population was probably, probably around 600,000. And for that age, day and age, that is a pretty good number. According to verse 2, God gave Jonah the exact message that he was supposed to speak. Now arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out to it this very call, which I'm going to speak to you. Now pastors talk about hearing from God and getting inspiration for their messages and so forth. I try to get out of the way every week to bring you what God wants, but God has never said, this is specifically what I want you to say when you stand up on Sunday morning. So Jonah had a little bit of a benefit there. <clears throat> so Nineveh, possibly the largest city in the world at that time, and here's this little Jewish guy walking around, and hey guys, in about a, round, in, in a month or so, this place is coming down. Why would they listen to him? Do you think anybody would take him seriously? Imagine going to New York or Tokyo or any of the world's largest cities right now, and walking around going, hey, about 40 days this place is going to be destroyed. Other than perhaps getting a little attention from Homeland Security, I don't think most people would, would uh, pay him too much mind at all. And yet, what happened? What was the effect of the message? Look in verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed in God. Now remember, I set this up a little bit in the previous messages because the people on the boat were pagans. The idea of there being one all-powerful God that Jonah was serving was completely foreign to them. It would have been the same thing for these people in Nineveh. They were polytheists. They had several gods. They had a couple main ones, but they had several gods. And this idea of there is one all-powerful God, and he's got his sights on us to blow us up, or whatever God was going to do to them, that would have been foreign. And yet, they believed Jonah's words. They believed in God. Why would they listen to this messenger, this little foreigner that had come into their town, their city? Why would he believe them? Think back with me for a minute. Think back. You know I'm always trying to put you in the scene. Think back for a minute. Where had Jonah just come from? The belly of a fish for three days in those juices I wanted to talk about. Now, surely he stopped in a creek somewhere and washed off. But are you going to tell me that it didn't have some kind of physical effect on the man? I mean, surely there were changes. Maybe it bleached his hair. Maybe his skin. You know, we, uh, maybe he looked like the uh, prototypical zombie that we see in, in, uh, from time to time in literature and whatnot. Surely there were changes that made folks wonder, what's up with this guy? And listen to the message he's saying. And they would go, what, what are you going on about? And why do you look like that? And he would have said, well, I just spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. Do you know why this is important? Do you know why God prepared that punishment for Jonah at that time? Remember I told you they were polytheists and they, and they worshipped many gods. They had two main gods, a god and a goddess. Nanshi was their main goddess. She was a fish goddess. Their main god was Dagon. Dagon was represented by an image that was half man, half fish. Think merman, okay? That idea. Except it was the other way around. Fish head, human leg. He'd just come from the belly of a fish, and he had a message. Of course they were going to listen to him, because from their point of view, he had just been in contact with their God, and he's telling them how his God had been in control of their God, and this is the message, my God wants you to listen, or he's going to destroy your city. That's what gave this little foreign Jewish guy credibility when he walked into Nineveh. He'd been in contact with their gods, and I put that in air quotes for you. What was the result? Look with, look with me in verse 5, chapter 3. 
And the people of Nineveh believed in God and called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his mantle from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and, and sat on the ashes. And he cried out and said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, animal, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat, and do not let them drink water. Both man and animal must be covered with sackcloth, and let men call on God with their strength, that each may turn from his evil way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn away from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. So God relented concerning the evil which he had spoken he would bring upon them, and he did not bring it upon them. It started in the street. And it reached to the palace. You heard those words. Can you imagine anything like that happening in the White House? Any leader, anywhere. Can you imagine that nowadays? He called for an outward display of penance. And in this case, I'm not talking about the type of penance as the Roman Catholics practice penance. Not in that sense of the word, but rather defined as voluntary self-punishment inflicted as an outward of expression of repentance for having done wrong. In other words, they realized they had been wrong and they were repenting from it. The idea is, we have really messed up here, God, and we need to get ourselves straight. He called for prayer. Look at what the king did. He called for prayer. Let men call out to God with their strength. And he was talking about calling out not just to the gods that they knew. He was talking about calling out to Jonah's God. And they just heard about him a little bit ago. See the power that God has, that the true, one true almighty God has when people hear about him. They change their minds. They change their actions. So the king called for prayer. He called for repentance. Look at that phrase that each may turn from his evil way and from the violence which is in their hands. Turning. That's the whole idea of repentance. Changing your mind about something, about God in this case, and turning from what you're doing, usually 180 degrees, to what God wants you to do instead. Turn from your evil ways and turn from the violence which is in their hands. Our world could use a little bit of that right now, couldn't it? We need to get the word out. Changing one's thoughts from ignoring or defying God to actually following God, getting to know him and choosing to follow his ways. The king understood the message, Jonah's message, and he hoped that a change of heart would be enough to change their destiny. Look what he said in verse 9. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn away from his burning anger so that we will not perish. What was the result? Now some of you are going to look at that and you're going to tell me God changed his mind. Because he didn't destroy the city, did he? But you see, God is God. Remember that pesky little verse that says the same yesterday, today, and forever? That being the case, does God ever change his mind? What happened? The people changed. And so God didn't have to carry out judgment because they no longer deserved judgment. God's not some tyrant sitting up there just looking for people to punish. He punishes for improper behavior. When you change your behavior and you turn back to him, he changes his attitude towards you. He changes his actions towards you. Have you noticed all of the disasters that have been around lately since things have started turning so far away from God? 
as much as I say, I say about that, because you go now, Dr. Clifton, you're going to, you know, anyway. I, I delving into areas that people make me, may think I'm a quack. I told, when, it was, was it Wednesday night I told you guys that it was okay to be a, a nut as long as you were screwed onto the right bolt? Yeah, it's okay. All right, so he wanted the attitude and the conduct of his people to change. Stop the violence. Stop the violence. Change and turn to God. Because perhaps God will relent. Paul said something about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, he was teaching the church in Corinth, which, you know, they were an excellent example for most of us because they were the most messed up church in all of Scripture. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty-one. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. That's what it takes, all it takes, is for us to judge ourselves. To look towards our own actions, to pull our actions in line with what God expects from us. So how was judgment at Nineveh averted? They changed their conduct and started following God's ways. They changed their mind, they turned, repented, and changed their minds about what they thought in regard to obeying God's commands. And it started with hearing the message from the prophet when the prophet finally got around to delivering the message. See, there's many points and parts to the way this particular thing worked. But they had to hear the message. Paul said this to the church in Rome. How shall they call on the one in whom they have not trusted? And how shall they trust on the one they have not heard of. And how shall they hear without someone proclaiming? You notice someone proclaiming. It didn't say anything. Some translations use unless someone preach. Well, preaching's not my job. We hire somebody to do that. Proclaiming the word is a completely different thing. And that is the better translation of that. How can anybody hear if they don't ever hear the word? How can they hear? But see, God had to get his prophet ready to speak his message. When Jonah first got the instructions, he went running the other way. How hard as he could go? Is God trying to get you ready for something? And you're running away as hard as you can go? Won't work, you know. I speak from personal experience. It won't work. He'll get your attention. He'll bring you back just like he did. That running away from God thing. How'd that work for Jonah? It doesn't work. How did listening work for the people of Nineveh? Pardon me. Verse 10. Then he saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. So God relented concerning the evil which he had spoken he would bring on them, and he did not bring it on them. As I said before, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What changed? God didn't change. The people in Nineveh, their circumstances changed. Well, what, how did this work? You remember? God spoke to his prophet. See, Jonah was already a prophet. He was already a man of God. Jonah, God spoke to Jonah and said, I want you to go to Nineveh. As I pointed out in the first message, that was the first time that a Hebrew prophet had ever been sent to a Gentile city. But instead of thinking, oh, this is a different assignment, Jonah got in a boat trying to go to Tarshish. And I told you before, there are several ideas about where Tarshish may have been, but it was nowhere close to Nineveh. So he was running away. He didn't like the assignment he had been given. Remember I told you about that. Part of doing God's assignment is being willing to do what God tells you to do when he thinks you are ready. Which is not necessarily the same thing as when you think you are ready. Sometimes God's going to ask you to do challenging things. Things are, that are a little bit scary. When I uh, finished 
Well, let me let me preface that by a little bit. Um, you know, there's this. There is obviously a spiritual component to being called to pastor a church. Obviously, it's, it's it's a spiritual job. It's a spiritual leadership job. But there are what 60, maybe 75 percent of the job. It's just like any other job. You send a resume. You get interviewed. People ask you questions. You ask them questions. You try to see if it's a good fit. First church where I was pastor, I remember the last time I met with the pastor search committee. And you get a feel for things. You kind of know whether it's going well or not. And I met with them a time or two before. And went away from the meeting thinking, this is going to work. And I went down the road and, and hit the uh, clover leaf to, to head back to the house. And I remember getting on the ramp. And it just all, all of a sudden occurred to me. Lord, I can't do this. Because I'd served in a lot of churches, but I'd never been a pastor before. That's a completely different hat, folks. And I said, Lord, I can't do this. And it was almost like the Holy Spirit was sitting in the passenger seat saying, well, of course you can't. Because if you could, how would the Lord get the glory? You see, you've got to keep that in mind. God's going to ask you to do things that you don't want to do. Jonah, case in point. Let me run the other direction. He's going to ask you to do things you don't think you're ready to do. But see, if you're doing it in your own strength, you're doing it wrong. You need to be doing it in the strength of the Lord, and you need to be willing to allow the Lord to give you the strength to be able to do it, not run the other direction. But he ran the other direction. What happened so that God got his attention? He let him go a little bit anyway. The Lord let him get on the boat, didn't he? He let the boat get away from shore, didn't he? We don't know how far away from shore it got before the storm came up. A storm so bad that it said it terrified the sailors that were used to being on the water. So Jonah made it a little ways. And not only that, the people on the boat were scared. The people on the boat were praying. And remember I told you where Jonah was? Down inside the boat asleep. Running away from God, running away from his problems, sleeping in through it. Everybody else is having a prayer meeting. The one who knew the one true God was sitting sound asleep. Did you know you can sit in the pews and be sound asleep sometimes if you want to? If you try hard enough? Wake up and listen to what God's saying. What happened to him? He had to be put into a very uncomfortable place so that everybody else was comfortable. It wasn't until Jonah hit the water that the storm stopped and the people in the boat were safe. And if you read the scripture, we know that they worshiped God. They made vows to Jehovah. They became believers because of Jonah's disobedience. Jonah, as he's sinking through, as we read in in chapter 2 today, Jonah, as he's sinking through, he's praying. He's reconsidering his options. You know, Lord, maybe I was a little hasty here. I'm putting words in his mouth, but this is the Clifton paraphrase, okay? Lord, maybe I was a little hasty here running away from you. Maybe I should have listened a little bit better. You know, I need to keep my eyes on you. I need to keep my eyes toward the temple would be the Hebrew phrasing that they would use. I need to keep my eyes on you. And I need to maintain the attitude that I am your servant and you're going to guide me where you want me. And when I'm where I want you, when I am where you want me to be, you're going to give me the strength and the provision to be able to handle those kind of things. And then I'm going to be able to, Lord, I'm going to be able to deliver your message. Now, if we were to go down, go further into chapter 3 and into chapter 4, do you know what happened? Because the people in Nineveh repented? Jonah got angry. Wait a minute. So he had good success delivering the message. People turned to God, and Jonah's not happy about it. Jonah had some problems, but we won't, that's a different counseling session for another time. But you see how the Lord used him, and you see how the Lord even used his reluctance to deliver messages in his disobedience, and then even in his reluctance, but he finally did what the Lord said. And an entire huge, probably the largest city in the world at the time, was saved from destruction because Jonah finally decided to be disobedient. If all the true believers 
in Prince George County or metropolitan areas around or Virginia or the U.S. were to actually get busy delivering the message that God has given us to deliver, our culture would change. Because it's the same God. Jonah didn't serve a different God than we serve. We serve a God who is showing a bit more patience. He doesn't wipe you out just like that now anymore. But if you read the back of the book, he's going to. He's keeping score. And he's the same God that delivered judgment in the Old Testament. That's the same God. He's just showing his grace right now, hoping that people will come to repentance. But the only way they can come to repentance is just like Jonah did for Nineveh. They need to hear the word. And that is the job that the Lord has given to us. He depends on us to deliver his message. The message of salvation and a deliverance from coming judgment, which is not something we talk about this much. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the instructions you leave, for the examples that you leave for us. Lord, good examples and bad examples, examples of what to do and what not to do. Father, I pray that you will touch our hearts, open our minds and our hearts so that we may allow your Holy Spirit to guide us. Lord, may we be listening carefully to the things that you would have us to do. And Lord, may we be ready to do them. Guide us in what you need us to do so that your message is taken forth from here. And it has the effect of what you instructed us as a church to do, to be salt and light to this world. Salt is a preservative and light to show the wicked things that need to be corrected. Give us your strength and your power. And Lord, give us a sense of willingness to listen to your spirit as we go. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Lessons for the Journey is recorded during the services of Bethlehem Congregational Church in Disputana, Virginia, where Dr. Clifton serves as pastor. If you find these lessons helpful, please click the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Join us next time for more Lessons for the Journey.